That's right, it's time for another analog IQ test. Today, brought to you by the number 17. So question 17 says that figure 12 shows another voltage reference circuit. Uh, its output, however, instead of being uh, DC, is oscillating at 10 megahertz. Using a 10 mic capacitor to load the emitter stops the oscillation, but this is a crude solution to the problem. What's the real fix? And if we look at this schematic in figure 12, we can see that we just have a non-inverting amplifier whose input's being driven from this uh, 6.2 volt Zener diode. Its output drives an emitter follower here, and the feedback for the op amp is actually taken from the emitter. Um, these are your two feedback resistors. Obviously one of them is adjustable, so you can tweak the output here. Uh, the intended output is 13 volts. And we also have a capacitor here across one of the feedback resistors, and that really just forms a low pass filter here in the feedback loop. So let's head on over to the bench and build this circuit up, see if we can't replicate that oscillation on the output here, and then start troubleshooting. So I've got it built up on the breadboard now, and I did a quick couple voltage checks to make sure everything looked like it was working properly. Um, and it does. In fact, it looks like it's working perfectly. Uh, I don't see any kind of oscillation here on the output at all. So I'm going to start uh, tweaking this output adjust potentiometer here, see if we can't get this thing to start oscillating on us. So I have channel 1 on the scope AC coupled to the emitter of that transistor, and I'm just going to start tweaking that gain pot. And yeah, you can see that the uh, the DC offset's changing, which is what's causing that fluctuation in the AC coupled input to the scope, but I don't see any oscillation there. Uh, let me double check with the multimeter, make sure my output voltage is sane. Oh, hey, look at that. Oh, I just had it, come back. So as soon as I touch that probe, the multimeter probe, to the emitter, there it goes, um, we start getting oscillation at uh, 22 megahertz here. So yeah, I'll take the probe off, put it back on, take it off, put it on. So if I can get everything in the same shot here, you'll see that as soon as I take the multimeter probe and stick it on the emitter, we start getting that oscillation there. So I can put it on and take it off, put it on, take it off. So we are oscillating here at about 22 megahertz instead of the specified 10, but uh, we're definitely getting uh, oscillation up there in the tens of megahertz. So let's take a look at the circuit and see if we can't fix this. Now I strongly suspect that this emitter follower is what's causing the oscillations um, for a couple of reasons. First, the LM301 data sheet specifies a 30 puff compensation capacitor should be used to prevent unwanted oscillations, and that's exactly what's being used in this circuit. Secondly, emitter followers are notorious for being prone to breaking into oscillation. To show why, I've drawn a very typical emitter follower circuit diagram here in blue, where we just have some bias resistors on the base and an emitter resistor here from the emitter to ground. I've also drawn some additional components here in green, which you would add if you wanted to build a Colpitz oscillator. So we can see it just takes a little bit of extra capacitance and extra inductance in the circuit to turn what is supposed to be just an emitter follower amplifier into an oscillator. And this is especially um, problematic because this capacitance between the base and the emitter is always going to be there because there's always going to be some internal base emitter capacitance in the transistor itself. So all it really takes is a bit of stray capacitance from the emitter to ground and a bit of stray inductance in the circuit to turn your emitter follower amplifier into a Colpitz oscillator. And since the transistor is really just there to drive low impedance loads, as a simple test, we can just take that transistor out and connect the feedback loop directly to the output of the op amp and see if we still have oscillation or if that stops it. So we are clearly oscillating pretty badly right now. Uh, so I'm just going to remove that transistor and connect the feedback directly to the output of the op amp. And that seems to have fixed it. 
Um, I'm probing right on that output, um, just as before, and not getting any oscillation out of there. So I think that the uh, emitter follower is definitely the culprit. Now, if you've watched my previous video on designing Pierce oscillators, you may remember that increasing the capacitance of these feedback capacitors basically causes more and more of the high frequency signal to be short circuited directly to ground. So if you make them large enough, you'll actually cease oscillation because there's not enough of the signal getting fed back in to the amplifier and being re-amplified in order to satisfy the criteria for oscillation. So we can actually add a capacitor here, uh, a large one, across this emitter resistor in order to increase this capacitance and short circuit that high frequency content to ground. So here is our oscillating circuit. Now I have a 47 microfarad capacitor that I'm just going to stick across that emitter resistor and we'll see what happens. So you can see as soon as I put that capacitor across the uh, emitter resistor, the oscillation goes away. And if I take the capacitor back off, it comes right back. And if you recall, that's exactly what the question originally told us would work. Um, however, as it points out, it's not the best solution. So let's look at alternative ways of preventing oscillation in this circuit. One of the things we can do is try and remove the straight capacitance and inductance that might be in our circuit. Now I have this on a solderless breadboard, so there's going to be a lot of straight capacitance you can't really get rid of uh, just due to the inherent nature of the breadboard. But, you know, I've got all these flying leads. I've got my probes here and I've got my uh, power supply hooked up through these long uh, inductive, and, and there's some capacitance in there as well, um, alligator clip leads. So if I just kind of move these around, you can see at one point it'll kill out the kill that oscillation completely so I can you know cause oscillation or remove oscillation uh, just by kind of futzing around with some of these probes uh, and leads there so you can you know get rid of this oscillation by removing these sources of stray inductance and capacitance so I suspect if I soldered this up onto a actual you know PCB uh, whether it be a printed PCB or just dead bugged um, then that would get rid of this oscillation as well. However, sometimes you simply can't get rid of all your parasitics. Um, and you know, you may have an unknown source or unknown load that might get connected to your amplifier. So you don't want your amplifier to suddenly burst into oscillation if someone connects a particularly inductive source or a particularly capacitive load to your amplifier. So the typical way to take care of this problem is to put a small resistor in series with the base of the transistor. And just like putting the capacitor from the emitter to ground, this serves to add a bit of loss into the feedback path so that those signals um, that might get fed back through here don't get uh, amplified, they actually get attenuated. The advantage that the resistor has over the capacitor is that the resistor is relatively frequency independent, whereas the capacitor obviously is going to have some frequency dependent um, impedance. So uh, typically you'll see a resistor used in order to quell these oscillations. So how much resistance do we need to add in series with the base of our transistor in order to stop these oscillations? Well, one of the criteria for oscillation, known as the Barkhausen criteria, is that the total loop gain needs to be greater than or equal to one. So we need to reduce the gain through that unintentional feedback path in order to stop these oscillations. Now, I've added a 10 ohm resistor here in series with the base, and you can see that we're still oscillating. So we have not attenuated the signal in that feedback path enough in order to um, bring the gain down to below one. However, if I uh, bump this up by an order of magnitude, uh, put in a 100 ohm resistor, you can see that we no longer have any oscillation. And no matter how I probe, that uh, output, we're not oscillating at all. And, you know, we don't have to have 100 ohms in here. It's not a magic value. It could be, you know, maybe 82 ohms or 150 ohms or 220 ohms. But 100 is usually a very common suggested starting point uh, for quelling these types of oscillations. So what does the book have to say about this? Well, add a 100 ohm resistor to the base of the transistor and the oscillation ceases. And that's exactly what we were seeing on the bench. And can you explain why? Well, yes, the stray capacitance and inductance in the circuit 
was turning the emitter follower into a Colpitz oscillator. And adding that additional resistance in the feedback path was attenuating that uh, feedback enough so that it didn't meet the Barkhausen gain criteria for oscillation, and we never broke into oscillation. So that brings us to the end of another analog design challenge. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, suggestions, or corrections, leave them in the comments below, and thanks for watching.